I want to take you to a slightly different place. My wife, uh, Lisa, is an interpretive planner. That's her main thing she did in her career. And she wrote a book about interpretive planning. And in it, she used a Vista experience model that's similar to what they use in the museum fields and a variety of other fields. But it, it, hers was unique. And uh, we teach it as an example of something to think about when you're doing a tour. And this applies at the tour level for a couple hours or for a full day, or if you were doing a week-long program or you're doing a month-long program. This applies for any of those. What's the decision point for your tours? Are they gonna do it? Where do they make that decision? Iowa. <laughs> At home? Yeah. How? Looking at a website. Or Looking at a website. Okay, so they do it through conversation. Cool. What if I say, this is going to be the best experience of your life? Should I say that? No. Uh huh? Yeah, we always say under promise, over deliver. It's really amusing because if you look at the Alaskan uh, outfitters, occasionally you'll see somebody who puts pictures of the big five on the front of their brochure. Very dangerous thing to do. Uh, Denali Aramark tourists told me, they said, we don't ever do that. We put things we know we can show them. Mountains, rivers, bald eagles, because they're always there. But they said, we don't put an animal on there unless I can absolutely take you out there and show it to you. Because as soon as you do, people show you your own brochure when you don't get it done on your tour. Of course, we have that here with dolphin swims and manta swims and uh, lava. lava. <laughs> and if you take people up to see specific birds and they've got, got to get an EEV, it's not on my life list. And for that stars. particular day, it rains. <laughs> the stars, oh yeah. I read the TripAdvisor comments. That's a hard one, isn't it? Yeah, an expensive tour rigorous to go on and then weather just absolutely does not cooperate yeah that's tough that's the reason if we're really good with the interpretive experience design we create a great experience and it doesn't rely on them ringing a bell because if that's it's if that's what they've got to do they've got to ring and we set up that bell we set it up in the words we put in our websites we set up with the conversation we have on the phone Yeah, it's tough. I, you know, I, my first trip to Alaska, I wanted to see Denali. I wanted to see the tallest peak in North America and <laughs> spent 10 days going, you sure it's up there? <laughs> I said, sure it is. I was on the way to the airport on my 10th day to fly back and it was illuminated. You could see it from Anchorage from the airport. It was beautiful. <laughs> and I'd driven by it like 20 times and uh, didn't get to see it. What's the entry experience for you folks? What do you think that is? I mean, decision is they bought the ticket, they're gonna go on the tour. Entry is when they have some actual arrival. Either you're picking them up at the hotel or they're coming here or whatever. Why is that important? First impression. First impression, yeah. And everybody's out of their own environment. Yeah. Yeah. What can you do? You can be friendly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Good thought. 
What else? Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Boy, that is such an important piece. When you get that wrong, um, you know, you got to know where the, the Lua is. <laughs> you got to know where, where they're going to get a, a drink, where they're going to get a snack. Uh, we, we have to have breaks. And, oh, by the way, safety and security. We haven't yet had this problem on this island, but uh, we've been, my wife and I have led uh, nine trips to East Africa. And recently there was uh, tourists kidnapped in Tanzania. Now, not a common event, but as soon as that happens once, There, there was a terrorist attack in Egypt back in the late 80s. It was 13 years later when Egyptian tourism economy recovered to the same point it was at the time of that attack. 13 years of it just going going to the bottom and coming back up. And if, did we have any event here that affected tourism <laughs> that you can think of? I can't think of anything. I mean, yeah, any, any 10 things that happened in 2018, but especially one of them. You know, that, I guess I hadn't thought a lot about the eruption. I thought South Cone is pretty safe. It's very vegetated. It's, it's no big deal. <laughs> Didn't we buy a place where we could see the ocean? I can't see the ocean now. <laughs> we had the meeting at the park and Ranger Dean was running down all the big calamities in 2018 and he got to end the list. People said, well, what about the missile alert? <laughs> yeah, we keep forgetting about that. We forget about and everything else happened. The missile alert. That was fun, wasn't it? I was out jogging. I was going, I won't even be home in 20 minutes. You know, so was, I'm just watching for the incoming. <laughs> uh, this is what a lot of organizations focus on. The tour, the program, the whatever the activity is that you do with people. If you don't get this right, you got a problem. We pulled into a very famous historical interpretation place in uh, Virginia. And they had a big sign that said, you cannot possibly see this place in just one day at the entry. And we sat there in our car and watched people drive in and read it and turn around and drive away. Then we, yeah, then we drove, well, and it was $45 ticket to get in, and it was about an hour line to get through to get in. And uh, we went to lunch with one of our members at, the, at uh, I'll tell you, it was Colonial Williamsburg. And w we went to lunch with one of the top interpretive officials there, and he said, we're in our 17th year of decline, and we just don't know why. <laughs> and I'm not going to blame it all on that sign. There are other factors. But they were blaming it on people not being interested in history. And I don't think that's a fair assumption. I, I think if we fracture any part of this, we hurt. You do this part well, you know, you do your tour well, you're taking care of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. They stop for a snack. I mean, I can't tell you how many states and countries I've shown pictures of Gary Dean giving fruit and banana bread to somebody and <laughs> handing out raincoats and uh, stuff out of the back of the van down at Volcanoes because I took a lot of the, the I took a lot of my best photos while I was on a tour with him and one with Danny Almonte and I've used them everywhere obviously the book <laughs> you if you have or have not seen it this is the book we use in the certified interpretive guide course and Lisa and I wrote it over a period of two years while we were teaching trainers to teach the guide course. And we, we kept asking the trainers, tell us what's wrong with us, tell us how to improve it. So it was actually a lot of people contributed to making it work. But when I started going through my photos, Gary was the obvious star of the photos. So he ends up on the book. <laughs> what's the exit? What, what happens at the end of the? Tour. I mean, you want to check in with your people before you let them go. Tell them something about the experience. Let them know that they are, what their options are for other experiences that they want with. <laughs> By the way, we have other tours on other islands. 
There you go. Okay. Um, again, you can ask questions at each of these different points through the, the program. Uh, we teach four stages of asking questions. Um, focus questions where you try to get people to look at something in, in greater depth or uh, interpretive questions where you try to get them to see if they really understand what you've been talking about or capstone questions. What do you think this place will be like if we don't find a way to protect these birds? What do you think we'll have in 50 years if you come back? How many species will be here? Not necessarily looking for an answer, but trying to get people to, I mean, somebody said it in that objectives part, uh, trying to get them to think, trying to get them to do it. One of the reasons you're doing that, first of all, um, any of you know who Sam Ham is? Yeah. Who is he? He's the guy I got my character edition from. <laughs> okay. Uh, character in a Dr. Seuss book. Yeah. Character, yeah. I got a picture of him in front of a fast food restaurant in El Salvador that sell everything they sell is made of spam. <laughs> I just got Sam with a spam sandwich sitting out front. He was a professor at University of Idaho, a cognitive psychologist. Um, and he's written several books on interpretation. And his more recent one um, is about making a difference on purpose, which gets at that idea that I'm trying to move people up this continuum. And he likes to say learning does not lead to loving. What does that mean to you? Knowing about it doesn't mean they care about it. Exactly. There's a difference. I could have put in the word, I could have put the word knowledge here. But how many of you passed a driver's exam? How many of you love, you're passionate about the rules of the road? Okay. <laughs> Motivations vary on why we learn things. There's all sorts of things we learn that we really care nothing about. We're simply motivated to get the license or to get the whatever. And the point being, understanding what do you think is the single biggest factor to get people to understand where they are, why it matters, what's important. Okay, they've got to relate it to their own life. That's one of Tilden's principles. There's another big thing that's kind of important about this. When you study persuasion, how you influence people's attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors, the models that they've used, there's the elaboration likelihood model and Fishbein's theory of reasoned action. I'm sure you'll want to go home and read these articles because they're real yawners. But uh, what basically what they say is in order for people to change their attitudes and their beliefs and their behaviors, they have to think deeply about something. And guess what? You've got people on vacation, on a tour, okay? They didn't necessarily come here to get an education. They may tell you at the front end, I want to learn from you. And But the, when you say, okay, there'll be an exam later, we get about 100 multiple choice, maybe 10 essay questions. That's, that's not why they're here. <laughs> Their motivation is they enjoy learning, and that's great. But guess what? Learning does not lead to loving, just knowing more. And of course, I, I know you've read the TripAdvisor comments. You've got one on uh, TripAdvisor, and I don't know who elicited it, but it was about somebody saying, my guide talked continuously, gave a lot of scientific information, and it was too much. I've done that to people. Believe me, I know the temptation. Um, when you're passionate about a subject, it's tempting to want to give everybody all you know all the time. And yet what may be better in getting their understanding is to ask questions that stimulate them to think more deeply. You know, you mentioned that, to ask questions to get them to think. Guess what happens? If you think more deeply about something, you remember less. That's another piece of the psychology research. 
is that people who are highly stimulated, Tilden has a principle called interpretation is provocation. What does that mean? Pro provoke them, you mean make them angry? <laughs> okay, exactly, to try to get them to think. The research suggests that if you accomplish that, they will remember less than if you don't. I'm surprised that like, a lot of people have pre-existing ideas of what Hawaii is about. And I try to, I, I try to precursor what you're saying. So like Kilo said, the island is not going to look the way you think it's going to look. Because I can tell you my experience before I came to Hawaii, what I thought it was going to be like. And there are places that look like that. But what we're going to see today is going to be completely different. And then they start wondering what it's going to be. So it's getting people And that, that's the whole thing. If we are aware of where they are and what they're doing, how they're processing all that, um, people tune out. I don't know about you, but when someone says something that really stimulates me, my mind chases rabbits. I, I go down side hallways thinking about what they got me to think about. And maybe two or three minutes later, I focus back in on whoever's speaking. That's a good thing. You've really done a lot if you get that done. Most of the research suggests that when you give people a hundred facts on a tour, the next day they'll know 10, and the next day after that they'll know five, and the next day after that they'll know one or two, and a month later they won't know any of them. So what can, what can you possibly land on a tour? We have an exercise we do on tangibles and intangibles, and the, uh, maybe some of you have seen that done before. Uh, it gets at the idea that interpretation is helping people make a connection between what they see, what they can touch, what they can smell, what they can hear, what they can experience tangibly with bigger ideas. It's an old concept. John Muir talked about it in his books. Um, it, it's, it's, it's been around for a long time. Great nature guides have always understood that they're not just teaching about birds and flowers and trees, that they're teaching about evolution and change and plate tectonics and concepts that are, are massive and uh, fascinating but they're not easy to get your arms around. You can't touch them, taste them, smell them, or feel them. And uh, do you talk about thematic interpretation in much here? What, uh, yeah, a theme is a message. It's an idea. And ideally, if you're really good at delivering a tour, everything you say will relate in some way to an idea, a theme that you have. And that theme can be fairly complex or fairly simple. But point being, research suggests that if, if I'm going to carry away information from your, your talk, your conversation, you got to give me some sort of Velcro spot on my brain. I need a, a Velcro spot so that the next fact you give me sticks. You know, uh, again, cognitive psychology says we spend roughly 15 seconds evaluating new information, and most of the time we're going, can't use it, can't use it, can't use it, can't use it, can't use it. So when we give people information, if you can figure out how to get that Velcro spot developed, that something to think about, have you ever watched the video of the blind man begging on internet? This will be an assignment. Google blind beggar and watch the video. I won't tell you any more about it. Someone 
sees the guy begging and he has a little sign and they change his message and his contributions from people improve. That's the, but see what the message change is. I, I don't want to get into the politics of this, but I want to ask you a question. What was Mr. Trump's uh, signature message? Build a wall. Build a wall. Make America great again. What was uh, Hillary Clinton's? <coughs> Better together. And I would make the point that they, he used his message consistently, put it on caps, and I'm sure we don't know what it means. And to some, for some people, it was a dog whistle for let's go back to the 1950s. But for whatever reason, it resonated with 59 million people, and he ended up with enough votes in the Electoral College to get elected. And her message was, first of all, two words, and I'm not sure what it meant, better together. I can think of a lot of ways to interpret that. Uh, but, and some of them are, <laughs> yeah. But, but the point being, uh, political campaigns that are successful figure out a message and they stick to it because they're aware. And that, that gets into another thing I want to talk about briefly. But before I do that, I'm going to go back to this model and, and ask you what, if I tell you that commitment is the change you get, I asked you at the beginning, if these are your objectives, how do you know you did that? Well, here's what I want you to think about. At the end of your experience you create for people, what do they do differently? And I always urge people to have, it's okay to have long range objectives, but I like to have short ones that I can measure now. Somebody suggested one, they asked questions. I got them excited enough that they wouldn't stay afterwards and talk to me. Okay, what else could they do? Go to TripAdvisor or Yelp and write a positive review five stars, best guide I ever had, wonderful experience. These guys care about where they are and what they're doing. What else could they do? Book another trip? Yeah. I was waiting for you to say that. And I've had several people say, well, how do I do that? So at least I know they've heard me. And you can go online and check it out, and this is something you can do right now. My wife and I sell coffee. We have a little Kona coffee farm. And uh, our little catchphrase on our business cards and on our ads are caring for community with every cup because we donate part of the proceeds of every coffee pound we sell to community uh, charities on the island and we want to say that and and your EEV fund shows that extra step of commitment but yet you, you got to talk to people about it at this stage of when they're leaving you you have to think about those sets of things hope if you had a good time here you'll tell your friends we always appreciate a review an honest review about how how you felt about the experience uh, you may notice on our website the EEV fund creates an opportunity for people to invest in the future of uh, birds on the island and uh, protection of ecosystems, of habitats that these birds are going to need in order to survive. So this is where we measure change. And the other thing I always recommend to management is it's, if you can do it, it's great to create a dashboard either visually on a wall somewhere or on a website where you actually put up the amounts, the change in uh, amounts of money donated to your EEV fund or the number of percentage of returning customers or whatever you're measuring that matters to you that's in this commitment range to create a visual location where everybody can check in occasionally and say, how are we doing? Are we getting it done? Um,
you know, I've condensed a 20-hour presentation into an hour and 10 or 15 minutes, um, which means I'm leaving a lot out and, and glossing over things that we spend time on when we do the Certified Interpretive Guide course. One of the things we talk about is brain rules. Uh, has anybody seen the book by John Medina, Brain Rules? He's a developmental molecular biologist. He teaches at a medical school in the state of Washington. And part of what he talks about is what the brain is hardwired to do. Because he says, you know, you can have opinions about how to change people's attitudes and beliefs, but generally speaking, the brain is hardwired in certain ways that you need to think about in your experience design and what you do with people. Um, he doesn't know what you do, but I, I know what you do, so I'm relating it to that. He has a book with, I believe, 15 brain rules. He has a good website that's a quicker way to see what his brain rules are. Um, I mean, the obvious one, you deal with this every day, people don't pay attention to boring things. So, um, I always want to shake the guide or stop them or do something uh, challenging if I'm with somebody and an animal goes by that is hard to see or it's a spectacular view and they pass it up because they're on the clock. They're going, we don't have time to look at that. We're on, a, we're on an itinerary, we're on an agenda. Uh, the interpretive opportunity. It's a moment in time when you could stop and make something special happen. You may make a connection for people that can't be made any other place. And you, you may be boring them by being so consistent. It's okay to be consistent. It's good to stay on an itinerary. It's good to be on time. But it's also good to recognize that people came here to have a special experience. And if you had just something that happened you stopped at a beach and there happened to be monk seals there, or uh, you stopped at a roadside area and you were hearing a bird sing that you know most people are never gonna see and you bother to show them or an EO flies over and you, you stop and point it out. Uh, engage all five senses. One of the reasons that Maslow's hierarchy of needs isn't just giving people food and beverage but ideally giving them the right things at the right time is when you turn that experience from, I mean, a conversation is great if you're good enough to make it a conversation, but if you're also good enough to make it a holistic, they smell things, they taste things, they touch things, they, they experience the place you take them and the stories in a way um, that most people don't think about doing on their own. That lasts. Anybody know what the Proust effect is? Yeah, there was a famous author, and I forget the name of the book, but it's Remembering Something or whatever, and named Proust. You ever have a smell that just takes you back to grandma's kitchen or takes you to uh, the barn or takes you to the some place you played as a kid? I know when I smell stinky crayfish, I'm in heaven because as a child I spent my time in a creek chasing crawdads to sell to the bait store to buy a bigger tank. <laughs> uh, uh, the Proust effect is interesting. They call them congruent smells. Um, most Starbucks tell their workers not to wear cologne and perfume to allow the smell of coffee and the pastries to be the ambient smell of the, the place for that reason. It's one of the reasons that the movies, they pump the popcorn smell all over the theater. By the way, they tested this. People uh, eating popcorn that was freshly popped while they took an exam did 20% better than people taking the same exam with no popcorn. And then they tried it with gasoline smells. And they turned out the same as no popcorn. 
that the smell has to be congruent with a good experience. It can't just be a, a smell. <laughs> so repetition helps. If you have a theme, if you have a message, an idea that you want to get across, and my idea today, by the way, is everybody can get better. Everybody can do better. I don't care how natural and skilled and easy talking to people and being a good guide is. You can get better at it. And you have to put out that effort to grow a little professionally through what you learn or, or what you experience professionally. But you can be better. And repetition helps. The very best thematic tours People introduce the idea that they have at the beginning of it. They reinforce it throughout their, their uh, conversation. And then they come back to it right before people leave. I, love, I have a talk I do where uh, it's trees inspire us both uh, physically, or inspire and protect us both physically and spiritually is my theme. And part of what I like to ask as a capstone question at the end of the talk to get them to think about it is if we had not protected this forest that you're standing in, if somebody hadn't had that thought 50 years ago and protected it for us to be here today, what would this look like now? Would this just be condos or a resort or a highway or, or whatever? You can be an advocate. You can be a person that helps your grandchildren have a place to go like this. At the end of a, that repetition throughout your talk helps land that as a, an organizer in people's brains. And they will retain some of the facts. Once you, once you light somebody up, you, one of you mentioned lighting people up. Once you light them up, they will read books on your topic. They will watch uh, shows on TV. They will go to movies about it. They will uh, look up things on websites. They'll, they'll collect it. But you got to sow that seed. you got to get the seed germinating and get them going. Every brain is wired differently. They actually <laughs> cut up brains of taxi drivers and they found out that the amygdala and the hippocampus, the primitive, what's called the animal brain, the primitive parts of the brain, were bigger and more elaborate in taxi drivers than they were in regular people. And part of what neurologists say today is that every experience you have changes your brain a little bit. And memories are not just laid down in the cerebral cortex, they're laid down amygdala, hippocampus, cerebral cortex, all over the brain. And when you, have, when you recall a great memory, if that smell triggers, takes you back to grandma's kitchen or whatever, um, your brain pulls all those disparate piece, places it stored that and brings it together. And of course, if you create an experience that's sensorily rich, that's got a lot of different things about it, the food that you served them, the place that you took them, the things you had them do, were so special and were so unique and were so multisensory. Maybe you had them taste a, a berry or suck the sweet sap out of a flower or do things they just would never think of doing on their own. That's all part of that. They're more likely to recall an experience because they didn't just listen to you talk. They tie it back to all those different things. It creates that holistic experience in their head. Take you back to the list we started with. I would suggest to you that satisfaction, I think you already know, you can monitor social media and you can, uh, you can ask people, will people you tell you the truth at the end of a tour? Absolutely not. They will lie through their teeth. I do it all the time. I go to a restaurant and I have crappy service and people come up and go, how was it? It's good. Go away. Uh, <laughs> 
you know, who wants to sit and have an argument with somebody about something you just paid for? What you're more likely to do is if you're only slightly incensed, you probably don't go write a negative in review. But if you're really incensed, you probably go really do hurtful things on media. So satisfaction is something we can monitor these days with the internet pretty easily. How do we know they connected? This is a review. We talked about these things. There's a lot of emotion there. Okay. They come back. Okay, ask them how they can help with conservation. I mean, part of what you can, uh, I always, I ran a nature center for 17 years in a, in a town that was, had 24% unemployment when I moved there. And every time I gave a talk, I had an idea of how many people I wanted to buy a membership, how much money I wanted them to donate, uh, what kind of questions I wanted to hear at the end of the talk. I had all these physical measures that were pretty direct, not very abstract, because we were not going to survive if I just hoped we did well. I needed, to, I needed to see it in our finances. I needed to see it in our return visits. Our uh, first year I was there, we did programs for 1,200 school children. The year I left, we did 17,000 school children. Those numbers still stick for me because I was watching this dashboard of all these measurable things that helped me understand whether we were succeeding or not. I needed to know that we were satisfying people, but that we were making a connection that brought them back again and again. Community Nature Center requires ultra repeat visitation. You, you can't, uh, I mean, we live with a lot of churn here because some people it's a lifetime visit to come here once, but guess what, there's people like me that came back 20 times and then bought a property and moved. Um, how can you tell they're excited about learning? Questions they asked. How, how could you tell in a more measurable way? Do you sell any of those books? Do you sell them at the, big, at the gift store? See, my point is, if you, hear, if you hear, have that conversation with somebody and they're interested in plants, and you can say, boy, if you have a chance when we go back to the office, we've got a great book on Hawaii's native plants, and, and then you can actually be aware of whether sales are doing well in that book. And to me, there's a connection between all of this. If I can get people more interested, they do things. They buy things, they return, they tell their friends, they, they do posts. I, I can invite them to go to our Facebook page and leave a comment and say, if you took a great photo, we'd love to see it on our Facebook page. And then I can be aware of how often I get that, okay? How can you keep your mission or your purpose in front of people? One of my favorite quotes in the world is Gandhi's quote, uh, be the change you want to see in the world. And uh, one of the things that bugs me more than anything about guides is when I see one walk by a piece of litter or, you know, not assist a wounded animal or not just be oblivious to, to some obvious thing because you're a walking demonstration of your value system. I, my silly little uh, daily activity is I go run two miles and I pick up litter. And I pick up Napoopo Road in Middle K.A. I've picked up 18,000 items in the last year. 18,000. 
in a year. Our island, <laughs> it's, it's local people, it's farm workers, and it's tourists. And it's more tourists than it is the other two. Because when the tourists are here, it quadruples. I can measure, I count number of items I pick up on many days and I keep track of it. Uh, may be hard to tell whether they're thinking in a new way or not. Care about and care for your EEV fund as a way to again see that in interest or engagement. See their home anew. I don't know how I'm going to measure that. But I would urge you to think about how you can look at the measurable parameters of, of what happens if you got the commitment, if you, if you got people to think, if you got them to care a little bit more. One final question. Do you think we move people from here to here in one trip? I don't think so. I, we always joke about you might go see uh, the Free Willy movie and make a big donation to whales, but maybe the next day you'll fly to Japan and eat whale meat. Uh, <laughs> most of us don't jump from here to here overnight. We eke our way up this staircase, and most of your clients will do that too. But I promise you, when you've done a great job, you're moving people up, and some people are going to tell you 20 and 30 and 40 years from now that you changed their life. Because I get that email from people, and it, it touches me deeply to think that something I did at a state park 45 years ago caused somebody to change how they raised their children, or because I did snake programs, and I, I asked them to quit killing snakes and quit picking them up. and let them be and love them, appreciate what, the, what their value is in the world. Thank you for letting me come here and be with you. Are there any questions at all before we quit for the day? Yes. I would tell you Grecian formula, but I actually haven't done a thing, so. <laughs> Thanks. My wife has white hair, and she, she just says, you just irk me that you don't. <laughs> <laughs> You're 12 years older and you haven't turned yet. Any? <laughs> well, that's lower maintenance. I think. <laughs> yes. Well, let me say it's a hallmark of your professionalism that everything you suggested were, that were your objectives relate back to your purpose as an organization. And I know everybody likes to get tips. It's great to have gratuities that help support your activity, but uh, that's not where you are. I would tell you this. One of the most inspiring things I've ever done is Lisa and I have worked f uh, on five occasions in the last uh, 10 years in the country of Rwanda, where in 1994, a million people were killed in four months. And, uh, and their tourism is a big part of the recovery. And the mountain gorillas population there has gone from 220 to over 1,000 in the last 20 years. And I'd be with these guides. And when I would do this sort of thing, there was nothing about tips. There was nothing about, uh, and yet some of them are living on $100 a month and consider it a pretty good living because there are a lot of people there living on a dollar a day. And their commitment is to making their country, their natural cultural resources better protected and uh, better life for everyone. And I, I know you're contributing to it. I've watched Hawaii Forest and Trail grow and become literally the gold standard in the islands and maybe in the United States if they those who know about you. So 
keep doing what you're doing. If we can be of help, we'd love to do that. And if you get a chance to take the CIG course, uh, I hope I'm in the room. Are you, uh, are you running the CIG in the near future? Well, I, we're not just offering the course. A uh, challenge for us is a place to hold the, the course and uh, knowing that we're going to have an audience. We could teach it down at our house, but guys, that's a, a long trip for people to go to and find us in South Kona. Um, we did it at National Tropical Botanical Garden um, last year and for all of their guides. And we keep talking to Paula Manui about allowing us to teach it out of the campus. Uh, that is the slowest decision-making process on the planet Earth. Uh, is that woman still there? Huh? Is that woman still there? Yes, yeah, she's still there. She's not the slowness, though. For what well, I know, she, I, I know her really well. Uh, the, the system is, it's full of caramel. <laughs> it's very sweet. Everybody's very nice, but it doesn't move, and it's very sticky. And when you ask, how can I bring this new program in or, or do this, they're, it's, they're very hard for them to figure it out. Well. Look forward to working with you at some future point, and it's great to see you again. Those of you I've met before, those who I haven't, remind me who you are when you see me next. From Hawaii Forest and Trail. Well, thank you. About appreciation. I will treasure it. <laughs> thank you, Steve.